Today we're going to take a look at sauces. Now, you may have noticed up to this point that a lot of what we've done has been based on French cuisine. There's a reason for that. The French really did a great job codifying cuisine, and they built a culinary tradition that was all about technique. Not recipes, not ingredients, but about technique. And once you learned those techniques, it really didn't matter where you went in the world, the technique would serve you in good stead. Sauces are prominent in French food, and so today we're going to take a look at sauces. Now, about 150 years ago, they took a look at cuisine in France, and they decided that they were going to make it a profession, an honorable profession, and that it needed to be more orderly and organized and efficient. And even within sauces, they came up with a great plan, and I'm going to tell you about it real quickly. They had this idea that if they could make a series of mother sauces, five of them, that you could take those mother sauces, which could be made in large quantities and stored very, very easily, and then turn them into any number of small sauces or derivative sauces. So as an example, you have a brown sauce, the Espanol, the Spanish sauce, which is the mother sauce of brown sauces. And they would say you could take that brown sauce and you could add a reduction of red wine to it, Bordeaux wine, and turn it into a sauce Bordelais. Um, one example. Uh, another, uh, the mother sauce Hollandaise could be turned into the sauce Bernays by making a reduction of tarragon and herbs and vinegar. Um, the five mother sauces are these. The brown sauce is Espanol. And then there's hollandaise, the emulsified sauce. There's a sauce called velute, which translates as velvety. It's a sauce made from stock. There's a sauce called bechamel, which is also a white sauce, but it's a Lenten sauce. So uh, on times of the year when you shouldn't be eating meat, it's made from milk. And then finally, there was a tomato sauce. Those were the five mother sauces. From that day to this, things have continued to evolve, and the mother sauces have been left behind a little bit. Not completely, but you're seeing um, lighter sauces, sauces with less flour in them, sauces that are made from the pan drippings of a piece of meat that's cooked, like the sauce that we made from uh, a chicken breast, a sautéed chicken breast. Anyhow, uh, I would like to show you one of the mother sauces because I think it's important to respect that tradition. And the one we're choosing to make is bechamel. And I'm going to start it right here. It begins with a roux, R-O-U-X. And a roux is butter and flour that are cooked together. And the butter actually separates the grains of starch in the flour so that when you add it later on to a sauce, it doesn't lump up. So... We're going to get started here. I'm going to break up this butter, and in a warm pan, we're going to melt the butter and cook the flour. I don't want the flour to brown, but what will happen is the starch will gelatinize just a little bit, and it will start to feel a little bit sandy. I'll show you that when we get there. Now, we need enough butter in this roux so that it's a semi-solid, semi-liquid. I think of it about the consistency of tomato paste, and I think you're on the right track there. It's slightly more flour than butter. Now, it's important that you keep stirring this. You don't want it to burn. In fact, you don't want this to color at all. A bechamel is a white sauce, and so we don't want our roux to be colored but we do want to cook it long enough for the raw flavor to go out of the flour. If I were making a velouté, which is also a, a mother sauce, and I was making a chicken velouté from chicken stock, I might choose to color my roux just slightly until it's pale, pale golden, and that would lend an appropriate color to my sauce. And if I were making an espanol, uh, a brown sauce, when they say Espanol or Spanish sauce, they mean that the sauce has a dark complexion. They would suggest that you cook your mirepoix 
excuse me, that you cook your roux until it's a, a deep, dark brown. Probably the color of hazelnuts, something like that. So this roux, at this point, I think is done. And one of the things I do to check it is to take a little bit and rub it between my thumb and forefinger. It's hot, so be careful, but it should feel a little bit sandy. It shouldn't feel velvety the way flour feels. It should feel just a little bit sandy. Now, we're going to use that roux to thicken all of this milk right here. And I'm going to pull this off and just share with you that when I add the milk, it will begin to thicken almost immediately. The, the starch granules will begin to swell and they will absorb the liquid. And you should be ready for that. I switched to a whisk. This is a sauce whisk that has a, a finer tip and heavier wires so that I can get into the corner of this, of this pan. And I'm going to add a small amount of cold milk. And I'm going to stir that in. And if you were able to see, it immediately thickened. And I take advantage of the thickness of that mixture to break up any lumps. And then I'm going to introduce more liquid. And again, as it heats up, it will begin to thicken. And I take advantage of this thickness to break up any lumps. And I carry on like that. And incrementally, my sauce will get looser and looser and looser. But along the way, make sure that you take advantage of that thickening so that you break up any lumps that may form. Lumps you don't want. Again. Take advantage of the thickening to break up any lumps. This is just whole milk. And soon you will find that you are at a point where your sauce walks the line between liquid and solid. And we're almost there now. Now, as I said, this is a Lenten sauce. So this would be used on Fridays when you were supposed to avoid the consumption of, of meat. At this point, when it's sort of semi-liquid, you, you make sure that there are no lumps because with the next addition or so, it will go completely liquid. At this point, I'm going to add all the rest. So incrementally add it and breaking up lumps as you go. And when you get to the point where it's nearly liquid, then you make one last effort to make sure there's no lumps and then stir in the rest of, or the remainder of the liquid. At this point, your bechamel is nearly done. It has to simmer for about 15 minutes. And what will happen over the course of that 15 minutes is it will tighten slightly, but it will also lose any raw flavor that is inherent in the flour. I'm going to put a flavoring in there as I, as I let it simmer. This is called an onion pique. It's an onion, and I've taken a bay leaf, and I've nailed it to that onion with a couple of cloves. And that will flavor this sauce as it simmers. 
So our sauce has simmered for about 20 minutes now. The texture is just about where we want, but it still hasn't been seasoned. So uh, I have some salt, and I think we need to season it with salt. Uh, I would not put black pepper into a white sauce like this. I think that would be a mistake. And consequently, I'm going to put a little bit of cayenne pepper in instead, which will give me the, the spice without any of the, the dark flecks. And then in a sauce like this, I also like a little pinch of nutmeg. We're close. So that's bechamel done. But in the spirit of French cuisine, I'm going to take a portion of this and put it into another pot, and we'll turn this into sauce Mornay. I'll do it right here on the cutting board. Sauce Mornay has added to it a little bit of mustard. We'll stir that in. And cheese. This is Gruyere. And this is quickly becoming a cheese sauce, huh? And you may discover with the additional ingredients, the flavor is bigger and it, it may need to have its seasoning adjusted slightly. A little bit more salt, another pinch of cayenne, and a little bit more nutmeg. We'll put this out of our way. And there's a derivative sauce. It's all done. Now, what would you do with it? Well, I have some cooked macaroni or some cooked pasta here. And we could make quickly a macaroni and cheese. I'm going to put a little bit extra sauce in here because this pasta will be thirsty as it bakes. And then we'll cover the top with some breadcrumbs and just a little bit more grated cheese so we get a nice gratin on the top. That could go into the oven. If it was at room temperature for about 30, 35 minutes, at 350, 375, and it would come out bubbly and hot and golden brown on the top. So I have two more sauces I'd like to show you now. Another French sauce, but a more contemporary sauce called Beur Blanc, white butter sauce. And then we're gonna jump across the border out of France and we'll make a Spanish Romesco sauce. Uh, to begin the Beur Blanc, we need to have a little bit of a reduction. And I've got some white wine here and some shallots, just a few peppercorns. And I'll turn this up. A little bit of vinegar, probably about twice as much wine as vinegar. And I'm going to add some lemon zest as well. So, what this is going to give us is a wonderful, flavorful reduction. We want to reduce this down until it's nearly dry, au sec, almost dry. And once it's reduced down, I will strain out the solids and put it into another pan, and that's where we'll build our beurre blanc. So this is going to take a little bit of time. In the meantime, I'm going to make this romesco sauce. It's a very simple sauce to make. I've got some canned peppers right here. Uh, these have been roasted and peeled. The few little bits of the black peel on the outside, don't consider that a problem at all. It'll make the sauce look more rustic. 
This sauce is enriched with nuts, as are many sauces in the Mediterranean. So uh, maybe the poster child for nut-enriched sauces would be pesto. But romesco is very, very popular in Spain. So we'll put nuts in as well. I'm going to add some garlic to this. And then I have some smoky paprika. This is a paprika that they specialize in in Spain. It's called pimenton. It has a real smoky flavor. And a little bit goes a long way. I'm going to add some of the pimenton. And then if you like the idea of heat, a little cayenne, but not too much. Uh, here's some tomato paste. That makes its way in. And this sauce is almost ready to go. Now, in very, very old sauces, it was not uncommon that they would be thickened with bread. Um, I'm going to add a little bit of bread to this sauce as well. So nuts and bread provide the thickening and the emulsification. And off we go. Just want to make sure to strape this down. And then we're going to add olive oil and vinegar to this sauce and it will become sort of a very thick, creamy sauce. Scrape the sides down again. I'm going to take just a second here to look in on this pan. The reduction is coming along nicely. I'll give it just a second more. All right. This is almost dry. To the same pan, I'm going to introduce a little bit of cream, which has a very powerful emulsion in it. And I'm going to strain that so that all the solids stay behind. This is almost ready. Let me finish the romesco real quickly. I want to see how it tastes. A little bit of salt. I think just a hair more cayenne, not a problem. A little bit of the pimenton. All right, that tastes very good. I'm going to let this sit. And let's move back over to the beurre blanc. I'm going to bring this up to a boil. And we're going to introduce butter into it. Now, we want the butter to stay emulsified. We want it to stay creamy. So it shouldn't be just melted butter that breaks, but in fact, melted butter that is nice and creamy. And the way to accomplish that is to have cold butter and have a little bit of liquid to begin with. We haven't seasoned this with salt, so I'm going to get some salt in there right now. And once it comes up to a boil, I'm going to turn the heat down, and we're going to add the butter piece by piece. Now, we don't want it to boil because boiling over time will make this sauce break. 
but we don't want to spend the entire day here either. And so having the heat high enough so that it's not boiling, but uh, that the butter is melting is about where we want to be. When the last of the previous butter has melted, then we'll add some more. And you're looking for a nice, thick, creamy sauce. If I had started with red wine instead of white wine, I would have what's known as a burr rouge or a red butter sauce. I could have added citrus juice to my reduction and made a butter sauce that tasted of grapefruit or of lime or of orange for that matter. I can put all manner of herbs into this sauce. Once it's made, holding a sauce like this um, is a little bit of a challenge. You need to make sure that it stays warm, but not too hot. In a restaurant, they might put it into a thermos and keep it hot that way. Uh, if you have a warm spot at the back of your stove, I would say that's entirely appropriate. And I wouldn't try to hold on to this sauce for hours on end. You know, kept warm, it will do very well for an hour or so. All right, let's put all the rest in here. I'm going to turn the heat off. I think there's plenty of heat in this pan to bring it home. And what we need to do is just taste and season this. I already put a little bit of salt in. I'm going to add just a hair more. Um, black pepper, probably not appropriate because it's a white sauce. Even white pepper may be a little bit too, uh, too dark. And so I'm going to add just a pinch of cayenne. And recognize that this is a sauce, so it should taste a little bit sharp. I'm going to add some lemon juice just to brighten it up. We are very close. If I were to take and put a spoon in here and show you that it coats the back of a spoon, that's, that's indicative of a well-made sauce. The fact that you can draw your finger through there and see that it coats the back of a spoon. The French call that nappe. I call it coating. Delicious. All right, back to our romesco. Now that it's had a chance to sit for just a second, I'm going to taste it one more time. A little bit more salt, a little splash of lemon juice or sherry vinegar. I think that sauce is ready to go as well. This sauce, some people characterize it as the ketchup of Spain. It's great with grilled food. It's great with grilled seafood. It's great with grilled vegetables. Um, there's a soup that takes its name from this sauce called romesco, where they make a fish broth and they flavor it with romesco. They cook potatoes in that broth. And then when the potatoes are cooked and the broth is nicely flavored, they take the fish and they introduce it. And the whole dish is called uh, romesco. Now, I also have the beurre blanc here. 
and recognize that once we take it off the heat, the clock starts ticking. Because once it gets cold, the butter will set, and once it sets, it's not a sauce any longer. So, beurre blanc and romesco. So, let's take a look at how we might use these two sauces. I've got two different chicken preparations. I have here a pan-fried chicken breast, and I'm going to spoon some of this beurre blanc over the top. You can see what a wonderful consistency it is. I'm going to let it pool on the plate just a little bit. And I've got some fennel tops that I'm going to add. And then, uh, with the romesco, I've got a grilled chicken breast. And this sauce is a little more rustic. I'm going to spoon some just next to the chicken. And a little bit of parsley over the whole thing. And I think that the grilled vegetables will taste just as good with this romesco as the chicken does. So, chicken with beurre blanc, fennel, and lemon, grilled chicken with romesco and vegetables. So, let's take a look at a couple of Asian sauces. I've got one that is so simple, you won't believe it. This is honey that I have in a bowl, and into that honey, I'm going to add ginger and Chinese five spice, you can buy that at the market. I'm gonna stir that in, and then in goes soy sauce. And what we're looking for is a really nice balance between the sweetness of the honey and the salty, savory flavor of the soy. Now, the fact that I've got ginger and five spice will accentuate the aroma of the honey. And the only thing that's really missing from this combination is acidity. But I just happen to have some rice wine vinegar. So we'll add rice wine vinegar to it. And ultimately what you're looking for is a nice blend between salt, sweet, acid, and aromatic compounds. This is great over grilled food, a piece of grilled fish. It's delicious over vegetables. A little bit later on, we're going to do some wine and food pairing together, and I'm going to suggest that you put this on a piece of grilled salmon. I'm just going to give it a quick taste. It's delicious. This keeps really, really well. So if you want to have it in your refrigerator, uh, in a little mason jar, I think that's entirely appropriate. It will last easily for two months. All right, next I'm going to make a Thai recipe. This is a Thai green curry. Uh, this is Thai green curry paste, and this is yellow curry paste and red curry paste. When you know how to make one of them, you know how to make them all. And I'm going to show you how to make that right now. Um, we're going to begin with a hot pan and a little bit of oil. Let me make sure the pan is nice and hot. Now, when you make a Thai curry, uh, I usually say no more than two, tea, two tablespoons of this curry paste per 14 ounce can of coconut milk. Any more than that and it gets way, way, way too spicy. And I like it spicy. So if you don't like spicy food, maybe you start with half that much. Maybe you start with one tablespoon per can. Um, the first thing I want to do is sort of wake up the flavors of this curry paste. And we'll put it right here into the hot pan. And almost immediately, it becomes really aromatic. I'm also going to put some pork into this pan. 
and we will begin cooking that pork and coating it with this wonderful curry paste. This is a pork tenderloin that we cut up and it's a fairly tender cut of meat already so it doesn't really take much cooking. Now, coconut milk goes into this pan. And already you can see the color of that curry paste turning the coconut milk a little bit dark. That's entirely as it should be. I want to season this, and the seasoning is fish sauce. Fish sauce goes in as though it were salt. And so I'm going to add fish sauce and taste this. Okay, when it tastes salty enough, then you, you temper that saltiness with a little bit of sugar. All right. I'm going to add a little more coconut milk just because it's a little spicy. And this sauce is almost done. That's how fast it goes. Uh, I've got a selection of vegetables that we're going to add. I've got some red peppers. They'll take a little time to cook. And so I'm going to add them right right in. I was looking at red tomatoes. These are yellow peppers, obviously. They'll take a little time to cook. And I also have some snow peas that have been cut up. They take some time to cook. Uh, I have some chilies. If you like it hot, you can add more chilies. I would not. I think there's plenty of heat in the commercial curry pastes. One of the really interesting things that they, they use in Thailand is herbs, and they use them almost the way that we might use a handful of spinach at the end of a, a soup preparation. They put big handfuls in. So I've got basil leaves here, and I'm going to add those right at the end. I'm also going to add these tomatoes. And I'm going to turn this off because this dish is done. Um, you know, when, when you eat this in Thailand, we might say, tonight for dinner we're having chicken. They would say, we're having curry. And the curry is the dish. If you're lucky enough to have some pork or a nice selection of vegetables, that's the dish. But a bowl of rice and the curry is the thing. Let me get a bowl. And I'm going to put a little bit of this out so you can get a chance to see it. It's so delicious and so fresh tasting and so quick that this will be a go-to meal for you again and again, I think. Okay, so that's Thai curry with rice, a delicious meal on a piece of grilled fish. You can't do better than the five spice honey dip. So we learned a little bit about French mother sauces. We even made one. We made bechamel. And we turned that bechamel into a Mornay sauce, which then became this beautiful macaroni and cheese. And then 
a more contemporary French sauce. This is Beurre Blanc, moved from France to Spain, and we made uh, Romesco sauce, and then we jumped all the way to Asia, Thailand, and made a green curry. If you know this technique, you can make the yellow or the red curry. And then finally to China with this wonderful, simple little dip, the five spice honey dip that is delicious on a piece of grilled fish. You can take your knowledge of sauces and travel the world.